Hi, everyone. Welcome. Friday, right? The last day of reInvent. I hope everyone's enjoyed the conference so far and everyone's excited about the new features and services we've announced this week. Uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is James Saryerwini. I am a software development engineer at AWS, and I work on the SDKs and tools team. So some of the main things that I work on are the AWS CLI, as well as the AWS SDK for Python, also known as Boto3. And one of the other things that our team does is we take our SDKs and CLIs and we create libraries and frameworks that build on top of these uh, in order to make developers even more productive. And today I'm going to be talking about a framework that I've created called Chalice, which is a serverless micro framework for Python. In a nutshell, it allows you to quickly create serverless REST APIs and deploy them to AWS. And it can get you up and running in less than 30 seconds. And we'll see a lot of examples of that throughout the talk. In terms of what I want to cover today, there's really three things. First thing I want to do is go over serverless REST APIs and we'll compare them to APIs that run on EC2 instances and see what some of the main differences are. And then after that, we're going to look at Chalice and I'm going to show you some uh, a quick tour of some of the main features of Chalice. So one thing I will mention is this will be a very demo heavy talk. I'll be switching over to my laptop throughout the talk. I think that's just the best way to show framework, show what it can do, hop over to the terminal, write some code and deploy it. So we'll be doing that a lot. And then the third part I think is probably um, the most interesting, which is we're going to look at a couple of sample applications and I'll show you how Chalice can help you with some of the things that you'll encounter as you start to use it to write applications. So how do we handle configuration and uh, secrets and how we handle um, SDK generation and a number of other things. Before we get into that, though, there's a couple of assumptions I'm making. Uh, probably the biggest one is that I assume that everyone here can follow along with Python code, given Chalice is a framework for Python developers, that we're not going to spend a lot of time going over Python syntax. We won't use anything advanced, so as long as you can follow along with basic Python code, you'll be fine. Second thing is that we're not going to spend a lot of time on good RESTful API design. I'm assuming you're at least familiar with it, so if you've seen that style where you have a uh, resource that can map to a URL and you leverage the various HTTP methods, get, put, post, patch, and again, you'll be fine there. And then the last thing is more of a bonus. If you've used a micro framework in Python before, like Flask or Bottle or anything similar, uh, I think you'll, you'll find Chalice to feel right at home. All right, so with that out of the way, let's start with the first thing here, REST APIs. REST APIs, they're everywhere, right? from a web client uh, that has a uh, web application running on a desktop that customers connect to, to mobile clients, or perhaps you have a mobile game that talks to some backend API to store user data or game data. And even if you expose a REST API yourself so that other services can integrate with you, for example, GitHub or Twitter. And the nice thing about the REST APIs is that they're pretty straightforward. So on the left side here is what a uh, user of the API sees. You just make a request and you get data back. So in this example, I'm showing a get request to slash users. And uh, in this case, we're getting a JSON response, which is what we'll use throughout this talk. And on the right-hand side of this, the back end, you might use a number of services. So for example, you might use your data store as Amazon DynamoDB. Perhaps you have a caching layer with memcached and you have alerting and monitoring with Amazon CloudWatch. But the middle part here, this blue box, this is the part where we're going to look at in a little more detail. So here's one way to structure the REST API. This is a very um, standard way to do this. You would have an EC2 instance and a number of them running in your web tier. So in the Python space, you might use Apache with ModWizGee or Nginx with MicroWizGee or Gunicorn or whatever your preferred um, app server is. And all of that set up as part of an auto-scaling group. And you configure scaling policies, so you can scale up and down based on CPU load or network traffic or even time of day. There's a number of options. And you take all of that and you pair it with an elastic load balancer. And that's the actual endpoint that customers connect to that then routes to a specific web instance. And this is a great way to create a REST API. You do have to figure out how you want to get code onto that machine. So maybe you have scripts um, that SSH or SCP code on, or you're using Ansible or a Puppet or Shaft or one of your preferred config management tools, or you can even use um, AWS Code Deploy, any of the services that we offer. So when we talk about serverless REST APIs, so what I mean by that for the purposes of this talk is we're going to take um, the EC2 instances here 
and replace this middle part instead with two services, Amazon API Gateway and AWS Lambda. And by using these two services together, we're able to create a serverless REST API where AWS is going to handle running our code for us. It's going to handle accepting the HTTP request, and we don't have to manage any EC2 servers ourselves. Now, if you haven't heard of Amazon API Gateway, it is a way to create APIs where you specify the various um, resources you want to expose, the paths you want to expose, and then you can configure what happens on the back end once you make that request. And the nice thing about it is it handles a number of features for you that you traditionally would have to handle in a framework. So authorization, monitoring, um, access control, a lot of that is um, available through API Gateway. And the best way to think about it, the way we describe it in the documentation, is think of it as the front door for your application. Now, once you take an HTTP request with API Gateway, you can then configure some sort of backend. And the backend we're going to be using is AWS Lambda. And if you haven't heard of this service before, the idea is instead of getting an EC2 instance and you figure out how to get the code there, instead, you create a Lambda function, you give it the code that you want, and then Lambda takes care of running it for you. One of the great things about this is that you only pay for the time that you use um, for computing. So there's no hourly rate. It's just rounded to the nearest 100 millisecond. And it takes care of scaling everything for you. It takes care of running your code. It also can integrate with various AWS events. So say when a new S3 object is uploaded, you can trigger a Lambda function being run. And there's a number of other integration points with DynamoDB streams and Kinesis. All right. So if we want to look at our first serverless REST API, we want to set all of this up. Let's start with a simple example. We want to do a GET request, and then we just want to return hello world. That's, that's the simplest example we can think of, right? How are we able to set that up? So what I want to do here is first show you how you might set this up in a console. This is a good starting point that most people um, start with. And we'll just hop over to a console here. So we'll just do a single function here. Let me make this a little bit smaller. The way we do this, we'll create a new function that we want to use Python with. Um, we'll go ahead and just return hello world, which is what we wanted to do at first. All right. And once we do that, we're going to give it a name. We'll call it reInvent um, Demo. And normally here, you would create whatever roles you want to set up for your function. We're just going to use an existing one we've created. And we'll go ahead and say next, accept all the defaults, and create the function. And just to verify that everything's working here, if we go ahead and test this, what should happen? Notice we get hello world there. So we've just set everything up in the console. So that's that first part. And then we want to pair this with API Gateway. So what we would do is hop over to the API Gateway console, get started. We are going to go ahead and create a new API. We'll just call it also reInvent Demo. And we're only just going to do that single method there. So I'm just going to create a method that's a get method. And then we're going to pair it with Lambda here. So we'll say that we want to use US West 2, which is our region. And that function was reInvent Demo. It's going to ask us if we want to make sure we're authorizing API Gateway and Lambda together. We're not going to go over this part here, but there's these four different um, functions here. There are these four different parts and components. One thing I do want to point out is we're only dealing with 200 responses. We're not even looking at how we handle errors. And once we do this, we'll go ahead and create a new stage called dev, and we'll go ahead and deploy it. And if everything works, we should have our first API that returns hello world. All right, and so note here, I do want to point out, we only have single requests doing a single HTTP method. All right. So that was a, a first round of how we might start looking at serverless REST APIs, how we might be able to start experimenting with it. And we had this simple request where we did a GET request, and we returned hello world. And again, this was what we saw on the console. Now, think about what you would have to do if you wanted to start building out more of a REST API. So this is an example you see a lot. This is a pet store example. Um, if you're familiar with Swagger, they use this a lot in their documentation. And one other thing we noticed as we were creating this first serverless REST API is that we were having two different experiences here, one with Lambda console and then one with the API Gateway console. 
So uh, another way we could do this instead of the console, maybe the next thing we do is start over uh, with the SDK. And you know, if you're familiar with the SDK, the great thing about it is you have a lot of control, but there's still a lot of um, API calls you would need to make to set everything up. And so once you understand all the differences and you really want that fine-grained control of how to set up your API, you can certainly use an SDK. But this is where Chalice comes in. Chalice can help you create these serverless REST APIs. So taking that example we just saw on the console, here's the equivalent example with Chalice. So there's really just five lines of code here. So every Chalice app has the same three components here. First thing, you create an app object, you call it app. Second thing, you create one or more routes, and this is why I mentioned if you've seen Flask or Bottle before, this decorator-based routing syntax that Python developers really like and should feel right at home here. And then the third thing is you create an app.py file, you put it in your app, and that's all you need to get started. And so once you have all of this set up, uh, you can use Chalice, which also contains a CLI, to then deploy your application. So all you would do is you'd run Chalice Deploy, it would set everything up for you, and you'd get this endpoint here. All right, so that's the overview of it. Let's hop back over to the terminal and see this in action. Oops. All right. So first thing we're gonna do here, everyone see that? create a virtual environment. So I want to point out, I'm not really, I haven't started with anything, I'm starting from scratch here. So this is the same steps you would do as you're getting started. So like most Python projects, we create a virtual environment. And once we have that, we're going to activate it. So Chalice is a Python package, so we'll use pip to install it. And once we install it, um, we'll look at the various components in more depth. But to get started, you have a, you'll now have a Chalice CLI. And we're going to look at these commands um, throughout the talk, but the one we're going to start with now is this new project. So all I would do is new project, and we'll give it a name of, let's call it reInvent. And now if we hop over to this directory, it's created a number of files for us. But the one we're going to look at is just what we saw on the slides, this app.py file. So if I open it up, um, there's a couple of other comments here that give you more examples. We'll just go ahead and remove that. And you can see it's the same five lines of code that we started with. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this, and we'll look at the various features, but let's go ahead and just start with deploying it. So what this is going to do is start with the same process that we did in the console, where it's going to create an IAM role for us. It's going to create a deployment package, which is used for Lambda. After that, it's then going to um, create your Lambda function, figure out what routes we want. So in this case, because we're just starting with a Hello World simple application here, there's not a whole lot involved. Um, and then after that, we are going to um, <clears throat> create the API gateway resources, and then um, deploy our application. We should get everything up and running. Let me double check that I have internet here. Oh, sorry. Let's try that again. I guess this is a good point, uh, time to point out that if you wanted to redeploy an app, you would simply just run uh, Chalice Deploy. You don't have to actually... Um, there's no separate update command or anything. Every time you want this to work, you just run Chalice Deploy. Give this a few seconds. So one of the things that will happen as you're writing, um, when you run your initial deploy is it's creating an IAM role for you. And sometimes that role takes a while to propagate so that Lambda can assume that role. And so um, what you're seeing here is a little bit of a delay um, creating that first Lambda role. And so once we've done that, as we do subsequent deploys, we'll see everything um, get a lot quicker here. So we've created this HTTP endpoint. And now that I call my get request, or do an HTTP request, you can see we get our hello world here. Um, oh, and by the way, HTTP, this is just, um, I'm going to use this instead of curl. Um, if you wanted to follow along later, it would just be pip install HTTP. Uh, All right. So that was our initial deploy. I just want to show you how the workflow would go if you wanted to add more features here, more routes. So let's go ahead and copy this. So the first thing I want to show is you can add any routes you want. So let's say a foo slash bar route. And so I'd say I wanted to return some arbitrary data here. You can also do name captures. So for example, if I wanted to say hello with a given name, just like in Flask, it would pass along the name for me. And I'll call this hello name. And perhaps I wanted to return the name here. And I can specify as many capture groups as I want. So I could say, you know, um, other 
and then I would get past another, and I could say you know last, and I'd get past another last. So as many of the captures that I want here, but we'll just keep it at hello name. And then the last thing I wanted to show was how you can introspect uh, data about your request. So say, we'll just call it put here. I'm gonna specify you have to send an HTTP put request, so no gets. And then what I wanna do here is just echo the body back. So the way that you look at um, attributes of your current request is you would say app.currentRequest, and there'd be dot, and then there's a couple of things here. Let me, um, is there see, so there's claims, context, headers, JSON body, and so the one we're gonna look at here is just JSON body. So we're gonna take our request, whatever is sent there, we're gonna echo it back as the value of this key. All right, so now that we have, let me double check. Now that we have that in place, we'll just go ahead and redeploy our application. And so what's happening here is it's taking our code, figuring out what changed, and then sending the updates to Lambda, and then reconfiguring API Gateway for us. And so once this finish, finishes deploying, we'll go ahead and take a look at um, all these features here. So we'll remind ourselves of what we've added. We'll go through each of these routes. So if I do an HTTP GET request to foo slash bar, we should get a foo slash bar response. There we go. And now if we do a request to that named capture, so I can say hello and then James, and we can see we're getting hello James back. And then you know, we can change that to anything, right? It's just going to echo that name back. And then the last thing we did was looking at how we can um, uh, provide metadata about the current request. So I'm going to send a JSON body up. We'll just call it again, hello world. And then I'm gonna send an HTTP put request, an HTTP put request to that, and, um, to that slash put route. So let's do this here. And we'll send HTTP put, and we'll change this to put. Oops. Change that there. Oops, so. Uh, thank you. All right, and so we can see we get this hello world back, and so if we change this to anything else, you know, hello to world to, we get same thing back, echoed. All right, so that was a quick overview of some of the routing stuff in Chalice. We're gonna see a lot more of that um, throughout the talk, but let's hop over to, back to the slides and show you a couple of other things that we didn't have a demo for. So. Uh, first thing, in the console I mentioned, we didn't handle um, errors, so how do we deal with error responses? And in Chalice, there's a number of built-in exceptions here, uh, and all you have to do in your code is import those exceptions and raise them whenever you want to trigger an exception. So we import bad request error, which maps to the HTTP bad request. And then in our code here, when we want to um, send an error back, we just raise a bad request error. This actually results in an HTTP 400 request with a code and a message. And so there's a number of these built-in ones that map to the various HTTP status codes. All right, second thing, I just wanted to show another example of how you can introspect more stuff about the metadata of a request. So in this case, we're pulling app.currentRequest, which we saw in the um, previous demo here. And the thing I wanna point out here is this is updated every request. So since we don't have to worry about Lambda running our code in multiple threads, this current request we can access whenever our view function is called, and we know that that reflects the current request. And here's an example of where we're actually dispatching based on the current method. So again, if you've used Flask before, uh, this should seem uh, very familiar to you. And the last thing I wanna stress here is I asked the question, how would this look in the console um, if we wanted to configure the pet store? And so here's the equivalent routing code in Chalice. And if you deploy this app, you'll see in API Gateway, it actually creates all of these routes for you. And we'll look at why this matters. There's a number of advantages you get if you leverage API Gateway to actually create all of the various routes for you. And you'll see that in the sample applications. All right, so if we zoom out a bit from the runtime that we've seen with Chalice, there's actually a couple of components um, that, that make up Chalice. First one is in addition to that routing API, there's also a runtime that Chalice is injected into your Lambda function. So this is the normal flow for uh, working with API Gateway and Lambda, and we saw those kind of four corners there when we looked at the console. And Chalice manages all of this part here, but if we take a look at Lambda and we zoom into what Lambda actually is doing here, um, normally you have a Lambda handler, and we saw this in the console where it takes two arguments, event and contacts, we didn't really look at them, but 
what you do is you return some value from your function and then that goes back to API Gateway. So what Chalice does is there's a small uh, component that it has in its library that actually works with Lambda and understands the event and the context and figures out how to map that to a request object that you can then use in your own code. And then from there, it calls into your app.py file um, in order to call the appropriate view function and then also handles the responses. So that's the runtime component. Uh, the other two components are the command line interface and then the configuration and packaging. So let's take a look at these last two. Let's say that I'm on my uh, computer here and I have my app.py and requirements file. If I run Chalice Deploy, what that's going to do is generate a deployment package here. So if you've worked with Lambda, you know you have to create a zip file of all your dependencies. So it handles installing your requirements files into a virtual environment, getting all of that set up for you. And once we do that, we just saw there's a small runtime that it injects. It's the wrapper to Lambda and your code. And so it's gonna put that as part of your deployment package. And then it takes that and it sends it off to AWS and it uploads it. And once that's done, it then talks to API Gateway and Lambda and IAM to get everything up and running. Okay, so that was the end of the second part. Just to recap what we've looked at so far, we've looked at how we can set up Chalice we looked at um, creating a new Chalice project. We saw how to deploy it. And then we saw a quick tour of some of the Chalice routing APIs, how we handle methods, how we handle name captures, um, and those kinds of things. All right. So now this is the third part. Um, I think the part that we're going to see a lot of um, more real world use cases as you start to write applications, how we, you can use Chalice to um, solve some of these problems for you. So the first example we're going to look at, we're going to look at a couple. But the first example is a GitHub bot. Um, this is, I think, a, a lot of, uh, I've seen Chalice use to create various bots, GitHub bots, Slack bots, and what we're going to do is have a welcome bot. So the idea is pretty straightforward. If someone goes to your GitHub issue, or GitHub uh, repo, and they create an issue, we want to then comment on the issue welcoming them, and we can imagine how we might have more um, complex logic, but we'll show how to just get all the pieces set up. So here is a sequence diagram of what we're going to shoot for. On um, the basic steps here, a user goes to your GitHub repo. They open an issue. And GitHub has a webhooks integration, so it's going to trigger this issue created event. That issue created event is then going to send an HTTP POST request to API Gateway. And then API Gateway, as we've seen, will then invoke our Lambda function, which calls into Chalice, which is going to call our new issue. And then after we do that, in our view code, we're then going to call back to GitHub, and we're going to issue a comment here that says, welcome to the repo. And so maybe, um, for now, we're just going to do a static message that says, welcome to the repo in the name, but perhaps we could have um, some sort of link to a contributing guide. We could check if this is their first time commenting on an issue, and we could give them a lot more advanced logic here. And just to reiterate, this part that's highlighted is the part that Chalice is going to handle for us, the part that we're going to look at. And the part on the left-hand side is all that GitHub has. And so we don't need to do anything there. We just need to configure that. All right. So let's take a look at how we do this. So first thing here, uh, I'm going to install Boto3, the AWS SDK for Python. So the first thing that comes up is if you've used the GitHub API before, you know that you have to create a personal access token, which is some sort of API key that identifies who you are, and um, GitHub can check that you have, sorry, the sufficient permission, permissions to access whatever action you're trying to do. So we want to figure out how we can store that API key, because we don't necessarily want to check it into source, but at the same time, we do need that API key in order to work with GitHub. So, there's a number of ways to do this. I'm going to highlight one particular approach that works for this example, and that's to use KMS. So I'm going to show you an example in the REPL just so that we get the concepts, and then I'll show how we actually use this in our application. So if you haven't used KMS before, what we're going to do is a couple, there's a couple of methods here we're going to use. Um, first thing we're going to do, just to give you a demo of this, is we're going to create a key, and then we're going to have a key ID here. We'll just use the default for now as we demo this. And now I'm going to use, there's two methods here, encrypt and decrypt. So the idea is that I have a key ID, and then I can give it some plain text and say my secret. And KMS is then going to encrypt that and give us a ciphertext blob back. So we're going to get um, this encrypted content back. If I wanted to store that, I could store that as um, ciphertext blob. And then if I actually wanted to put it in a JSON file, what I might do, instead of storing binary content, I could just um, maybe encoded as base64, just so that we have ASCII values here. 
And then in my app code, when I wanted to um, decrypt it at runtime so that I can grab that API key, what I would do is call KMS decrypt, and I would just give it the ciphertext blob of this encrypted content, and you can see we get plain text back. So in my code, I would actually just run this in plain text to get my secret. So this is how we're going to handle dealing with the API keys in GitHub. All right, so let's hop over to the code here. So I wanted to give you um, an overview of the project here and the structure, because there's actually a few new things that we're going to look at that we haven't looked at so far. So we see our app.py file, which is what we've seen so far. But the first new thing I want to show is there's a chalice lib directory. So if you wanted to structure your application with multiple files, you didn't want to put everything in an app.py file, you can put it in chalice lib, and chalice lib will automatically be included when the deployment package is generated. And in particular, I want to look at this config.json. So what we're going to do is add config data in the config.json file. So if we take a look at that, We can see that we have our encrypted contents here for a GitHub API token. There's also an HMAC thing that we'll look at in just a second. And I can put any other config data that I want here. Now that I do that, if I take a look at the secrets module, which is something I'm going to create um, as part of my application, we have the same steps here that we saw in the REPL, where um, this file name is this config.json file. And then what I'm going to do is open that file, and I'm going to load the JSON contents here. And then I'm going to grab the key name, so maybe GitHub, <coughs> HMAC webhook, or the API token. Once we do that, we'll go ahead and call, we'll create a KMS client, we'll decrypt our data, and then we'll return the plain text. So this is what we're going to use to um, create and retrieve secrets as part of our application. Now the way we're going to use this, let's hop over to the app.py file here. The way we're going to use this is notice on this line, we're importing that secrets that we just looked at. And then here we're calling secrets.get secrets for both the API token and the HMAC webhook. And then we're using the GitHub 3, which is a third party library to work with the GitHub API and passing in that GitHub API token. So one quick caveat I want to mention is this approach works because I only have one, well, in this case, two secrets that I'm decrypting. Um, as you have more secrets, a better approach would be to generate a data key, do the client-side encryption, and then just encrypt that key. But here we can keep it simple because we're just dealing with a small number of secrets. All right. And once we do that, um, let's walk through some of the code here. So I'm just adding a who am I. This is a quick sanity check to make sure that everything works um, as expected. And then the main logic here is in this new issue. This is what we're going to hook up to GitHub. So if we walk through this code here, we've seen the current request metadata. So we've done this so far. And all we're going to do is pull the JSON body out. And so once we do that, um, first thing we're going to do is validate that this is a valid request from GitHub. So we want to make sure we're not just responding to any arbitrary event here. We want to make sure that these requests that we're handling are actually legitimate requests from GitHub. And the way that GitHub um, enables this for us is via HMAC. So you both establish a shared secret. When you configure the HMAC, you give it the secret. And then it sends that value in a header. You compute it. You make sure they match. And if they do, then you, can, uh, you know that it's a valid request. So the first thing, we pull out the XHub signature that GitHub sends, and we store that as the expected value. Next thing we do is we calculate that signature ourselves to make sure everything uh, matches up. So we're using the standard HMAC library. We're using that GitHub HMAC secret that we pulled from that secrets module. And then we're going to update it with the raw body. So this is the actual bytes of the HTTP request that Chalice has um, enabled for you. And it maps it through in its request metadata. And then the next thing we're going to do is actually check that the um, expected signature matches what we've calculated. So here we're going to use hmac.compare digest, just a constant time comparison. And if it doesn't match up, we're going to say that it failed. We ignore the request. Um, otherwise, we assume or we know that hmac validation passed. And once we do that, we now know that the request is valid and we can have uh, implement our main logic here. So in this case, we're just checking if the user opened an event. We're going to grab some information about the repo. We're going to grab the issue number, create an issue object, figure out who opened the issue. And then we're going to create a comment on GitHub. This is saying, welcome to the repo, person who opened it. I'm uh, James Bond. I'm here to help. All right. So now that we've done that, um, the second thing I want to show, or the third thing I want to show 
is a requirements.txt file. So if you've used this before, you know, put all of your dependencies in here, and as part of the deployment process, Chalice creates a virtual environment, installs your requirements, or installs the dependencies from your requirements, and then sends that up to Lambda. So that's how we're managing third-party packages as well. All right. So we're going to go ahead and deploy this. And as that's going, um, I'll go ahead and set up the GitHub component. So the nice thing about this is this is a really straightforward process with GitHub. It makes it very easy. So let's do a quick sanity check here. We can do the who am I. This will make sure that everything works. So this at least shows we ran the module initialization code. We can get the username back. And now we can set this up in GitHub. So have a helper script here that's going to open up GitHub for me. And let me grab a password here. Um, I just have my passwords in a, uh, I use key pass, so I'm just going to copy them out here. And now all we have to do is just hook this up to GitHub. So we need to put the URL here. And Chalice has another command here to grab the URL. So you just run Chalice URL. And then I'm going to paste this in to new issue. And then we talked about that established um, shared secret. So in this case, um, I have um, a secrets helper that's going to set everything up for us. And again, if we take a look at that config key, it's called GitHub HMAC webhook. So I'll actually just run that locally here. So we have some random data here. Now if I put that in, we're going to say we only care about issues. We don't really care about push. And we'll go ahead and set everything up here. And we can also go back into this to double check. It's going to send a test payload here. So if we do that, we can see that it sent a test payload. Everyone see that? Um, so there's this XHub signature, which is the thing that we're going to validate. Um, and we're going to compare that to what we get. You can notice here, again, we get a 200 response back. So now, if we go to the issues, try it out, say, um, you know, a new user found a bug, help me. What's going to happen, it's going to call into our webhook, and then JamesBot's going to come along, and it's going to say, welcome to the project. So it's pretty straightforward to set up. Uh, one other thing I want to show here is, while this seemed pretty straightforward, like most things, sometimes things can go wrong. So let's say something goes wrong here. Let's say in my secret, I put the wrong shared secret. So I'm just going to put bad value here. What should happen is because we're using different secrets, uh, validation should fail, or verification should fail, and we shouldn't be doing anything on a new issue. So if I go back into this and I say, help again. If I comment on this issue, we'll notice here we should not get anything back. So now, how do we troubleshoot our application? What happens when things go wrong? What's their next step? Chalice gives you a couple of things here to help you. First, notice when we created our app, we created an app with a log of set level um, to debug. So app.log is just a standard logging.getLogger object. It just configures it with a few helpful defaults. So there's a stream handler. There's a logging formatter that works well with CloudWatch logs. And Lambda has integration with CloudWatch logs. So what's nice about this is now that it's I'm, I have an issue here. I can run chalice logs to give me a tail of that log. I'll actually just take a look at, say, the last 10 lines here. And what this is going to do is call to um, uh, the CloudWatch logs um, API and show us some of the last log messages. So thing to note here, it's kind of hard to see. So see this first line here, SHA-1 is like 9 uh, AE, and the actual signature is like 467. So then we get that last message that says, Signature validation failed, ignoring requests. And so now that we know what went wrong, we can go back into GitHub, update everything, and would be all set. All right. So to recap what we looked in this first sample app, um, just to give you an idea of what you can do, we looked at a way that you can manage secrets and config, and there was that caveat because we had a small number of secrets using KMS Decrypt would work for our case. We also looked at how you can use multi-file Chalice applications. So by using Chalice lib, you can put all of your additional libraries and your config files in that directory, and it will automatically take care of sending that to Lambda. Third thing we looked at is how we can troubleshoot. So when things go wrong, we have debug logs configured, and we saw how we can use Chalice logs to then look at and troubleshoot our problem. All right, so that was the first one. Uh, second one is a single page app, and, and really this is kind of a um, not just single page app, but a more traditional setup here where, you know, a lot of times you'll have, um, say, static content served via CloudFront or S3, and what you want to do is um, use 
your preferred uh, JavaScript framework, say React or Angular, and to make API calls to some sort of REST API, take that data and then render your components, um, render your components in the browser. So the first part we're going to look at is this app.py file again. And we're not going to actually um, look at the code in too much depth. But uh, for the sample app, imagine some sort of leaderboard. So you have a game that has users, and those users have scores, and you're going to keep track of the high scores for the game. So there's two things new that I want to show here that we haven't looked at. Um, first is this cores equals true. So in order to work with browser, we need to enable cores. And Chalice has um, this mode that you specify, cores equals true. And it will configure all of this for you. So it'll set the appropriate headers. It also configures a pre-flight request so that um, if you're sending something like a put or a, um, something that's going to require pre-flighting, it will respond appropriately. And the uh, second thing I want to show is um, we're using Boto3 here. So here we're using DynamoDB as our data store. And then we're not going to look at the, um, the actual resources, but imagine here we have games. For a particular game, you can look at the leaderboard. Um, for games, you can look at users um, for that particular game. And so far, what we've been doing is we write our app, we deploy it, and then we test it out, and we see that everything's working. So if we can improve on that and have a more um, iterative loop where we can have quicker feedback, that's going to help us be more productive. And so Chalice has another mode here you can run, which is the Chalice local command. So what you do here, you run Chalice local. And this will spin up a local HTTP server so you can test your app out locally. So you don't have to do deployments. You can actually just make sure everything's working as you develop your API and then deploy it afterwards. And so the way this works, again, we can go to games here. We can see we have games. I would notice here that um, uh, the local mode also understands the cores equals true setting. And so uh, we can also go to you know, leaderboard to see all the scores here. And we can double check that, see if that looks right. And then once we're happy with that, we can deploy our API. So Chalice Local is another tool you can use to help you um, be more productive. So let's say we've worked out the API, right? We've seen how that works so far. We got our API. We're happy with that. And the next part we need to do is actually write the front end part. So we want to have JavaScript code that's going to talk to our API, get the data back, and then integrate with some um, presentation framework. So you could use you know, the browser um, APIs directly. You could use um, fetch if you wanted, or you could use even jQuery to just uh, make the appropriate API calls. But one of the nice things about integrating with API Gateway, so I mentioned if we saw that pet store example, it actually creates routes in API Gateway. One of the nice things about that is it also can leverage features in API Gateway, including SDK generation. So API Gateway has support for SDK generation using uh, JavaScript, Android, um, iOS as well. And the one we're going to look at is JavaScript, since we're dealing with browser. So the way this works is we run generate SDK. Here we're going to specify an SDK type of JavaScript, and then we're going to specify an output directory. So if I run generate SDK, and we want to have a JavaScript SDK, we can specify. I'm just going to generate it here in another directory here. And so if we hop over to that directory, you can see this um, leaderboard API JS SDK. So this is all from API Gateway. I want to stress, Chalice doesn't have to do any, um, doesn't have to write any special code to actually generate the SDK. It just has a wrapper on top of this service API, and we're allowing API Gateway to do all the heavy lifting for us. And so API Gateway is helpful here. It has a readme that shows um, how you can set this up. It gives you examples of how you use the SDK. And you know, if you look at some of the all the auto-generated code here. Um, we'll just look at one quick one. So say, you know, games, game, users, game, games, users. It generates all of this for us. All right. And then finally, just to show you how this would actually work, um, let me serve up. I have an index.html page that just integrates this. Um, just to give you an idea of how you would actually use this. So this is just a, a boilerplate thing that's just going to show some of the code that's running so we can just get a feel for this. So this is straight from the readme um, that I copied. So you have API Gateway Client Factory, and you create a new client. And then you notice how we saw this when we were doing Chalice Local. It's just a get to slash games, but we can call client.gamesget, get our promise back, and we specify that we want to display the results. So if we run this, we should get the same value that we got locally. 
Galaxy Invaders. Same thing here, if we run um, games, Galaxy Invaders, leaderboard, we should get the same high score list here. And the one thing that I do wanna mention, let me run that again and show you, is notice here in the response, we get access control allow origin. So it's integrating with cores as well when it actually deployed it with API gateway so we can use this in the browser. So the last thing I wanna show here is this part here. And we haven't looked at this in the app.py file, but I'm gonna try and run this and we're gonna see that an error occurred here. What we're trying to do is grab data for our user ID. And so if we look at um, the app there, there's actually one other route that I've written. And let's take a look at that now. Oops. The last route here is saying, if you go to game user and user ID, um, we want cores to be enabled, but these two new things are the authorizer, authorizer ID. So I've gone ahead and created these beforehand, but I'm using Cognito user pools. So Cognito user pools um, is the fully managed service that allows you to ha implement um, user sign up, user sign in, um, a user directory, um, and you don't have to manage any of that yourself. And so the nice thing about that is it integrates with API Gateway. So I'm saying that I want this to have a Cognito user pool integration for just this method. And what I'm gonna say is you have to be logged in if you wanna see user data, and you can only change your own user data. So here's an example of that as well. There's this new um, app.claims value here, which once you've logged in, a set of claims that come back um, are passed into the child's view function. So if you're familiar with the OpenID claim or OpenID Connect claims that you get, that's the sub here. And then we're gonna compare the user ID to the current user ID, and we'll say you can only change values for your own account. And then we'll have all the logic to actually update. So the other nice thing about this is because I'm still staying in this serverless space without having to manage anything, I also get a Cognito SDK generated for me. So again, I'm still not writing any JavaScript code. Don't really uh, prefer not to, or as minimal as possible. So if I log in here, this is using the Cognito SDK, which also has some really cool stuff. So it's using a thing called um, SRP, uh, Secure Remote Password, so it's not actually sending the password over the wire. And now if I try this again, now that I've logged in, you'll see I get the proper response here. I get my user ID here, which matches up to the user ID. And you can kind of get the idea of how you can integrate login with Chalice. And the nice thing again is we don't have to set any of this up for ourselves. API Gateway is handling all of that login workflow for us. All right, so at this point, uh, so this was initially all of the demos that I was going to show today, but um, there's one last thing that I wanna show, uh, a bonus demo. Um, if we look at what we have so far with this application, one of the things that I've glossed over is I've created this application, but I also have additional AWS resources, right? I have a DynamoDB table. Um, there's a couple of other things that I set up beforehand that um, I didn't really explain how you might integrate with Chalice. Now, the second thing I wanna mention is that Chalice is under active development. We're listening to user feedback and the things that uh, matter to everyone here, and we're constantly adding new stuff. So I wanna give you a sneak peek of a feature that's coming. It's not actually in Chalice release yet, um, but it will be, but I wanted to give you um, a quick demo of that. Now, in order to address this problem that I mentioned, we're gonna leverage something that AWS announced, I believe two weeks ago, which is uh, the AWS serverless application model, so AWS SAM. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it is an extension to CloudFormation that allows you to easily declare serverless uh, applications. So it has a couple of extra resources, a serverless function, an API, a simple table, and we're gonna use that with Chalice now. So let me check that out. Show you how that's a little different. So what this is allowing us to do, as we saw when we initially ran our deploy, the way that this worked is it used the AWS SDK for Python to make appropriate calls to API Gateway, to Lambda, to IM, to set everything up. But now with this new backend, it's a new optional backend that you can choose to use when you create a project. It's now going to use SAM templates and CloudFormation under the hood to do your deployment. So if we look at how that's going to work, in new project, there will be 
a use SAM template you can specify. And you have to give it an S3 path here. Double check. So here I'm going to specify an S3 location. And I'm going to give it a name. We'll call it um, um, SAM demo. All right. And it's still the same app that we've seen before. You know, it just has a single route. And if I wanted to at this point, I could run Chalice Deploy. I'm not going to. It should look exactly the same. It's just using CloudFormation. One of the nice things that this is going to give you is a new command, which is the package command. So the package command, what it's going to do is instead of deploying your application, it's going to create the Lambda deployment package. It's going to generate a SAM template, but it's not actually going to deploy your app. And so this is nice because then if you have other deployment tools, you can then um, use Chalice for what it's really good at, this declarative routing, creating API gateway, and binding features together. And then you can use CloudFormation to actually deploy your app. So I have to specify a location here. Let's call it packaged. And one other thing that I want to show is, I believe two weeks ago in the AWS CLI, we also launched support for SAM to make it easy to deploy these new templates. So in the AWS CLI, there, under the CloudFormation name, there is a new deploy command. And if we take a look at how that works, I specify template file, stack name, and then just the normal CloudFormation stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this off here. CloudFormation. So we'll specify a stack name. Call it reInvent demo. Um, we'll specify the template file, which is this app.json. We'll look at it in a minute. And then we specify that we are going to be creating IM roles here. All right, and so this is going to create change sets and execute the change set. So while that's going, there's a couple of benefits to doing it this way. The first is that you know we heard feedback that a lot of um, people have uh, significant investment in CloudFormation deployment tools already. They're using CloudFormation to deploy a lot of their things, and so it'd be nice if they could bring those tools and still use them to do their deployment. Uh, the second thing that's great about this is that when you use um, CloudFormation, you can integrate with other AWS services as well. So an example, a recent example of this, you know, with AWS Code Pipeline, you can integrate with CloudFormation to have as part of your pipeline stage to actually deploy a CloudFormation template. And then the third thing that's nice is we can address the original problem that I um, motivated this example with, which is I'm creating a DynamoDB table as part of my app, but how do I bring that all together? You know, ideally, it should be part of that same deployment process because that DynamoDB table is specific to my application. I want to deploy that as a whole. I want to be able to delete the stack as a whole. And so now we can take a look. Make this bigger. In this app.json, as we've generated this file, I could, if I wanted to, add additional um, resources here. And so Chalice will eventually have a way to merge all of these together, um, but you can specify some sort of cloud formation template as additional resources as part of your application. So if you take a look here, we can see this is the new resource type, a serverless function, and it's taking care of uploading that data to S3. You can also tell Chalice to not upload to S3, so it literally makes no remote calls. It just puts them locally, and then you can use those an AWS cloud formation package command to actually upload assets to S3. And it sets all of this up. So if I had more APIs here, it would flush out everything, and it would generate a Swagger file for me. And once that's done, it also creates a set of outputs for me. So the nice thing about that is if you wanted to integrate with other resources, so you needed to grab the Lambda ARN, if you needed to grab the function name, if you needed to grab the REST API, you can then integrate that as CloudFormation output stacks. So if I run CloudFormation, Stack name. Let's see what I called it here. Reinvent demo. Oops, let's call it here. Notice here we have our output for our various um, things that have been created. And here is our familiar endpoint URL. So if I then make an HTTP request, we should get back our standard hello world. So again, we can use SAM templates here as another mechanism to um, integrate our deployment in Chalice. All right. So that was our bonus feature. Again, I want to stress it's not in the Chalice release yet. It is coming, um, just to give you a sneak peek of what's there. So to recap what we've looked at so far, 
throughout the talk. We looked at serverless REST APIs. We looked at Chalice API, its various routing components, all the features that Chalice um, gives you to make application development easier using serverless REST APIs. And then we looked at a couple of sample applications. The GitHub bots, we saw how to manage multi-app files, we saw how to manage um, credentials and configuration, and then we looked at the single page app, which included SDK generation, included um, integration with Cognito user pools, and then there was that bonus demo at the end for an upcoming feature with SAM integration with Chalice. All right, so that was all the things that I wanted to cover today. Uh, please remember to complete your evaluations. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't, how we can improve. Um, here's links to uh, Chalice. It's open source on GitHub. The example applications will be at that read the docs link. I'll put all of that online. And once again, thank you.